From what I gather, there's, there's on average one of these gravitational waves detected each year since, since 20, 2015. Mm. Um, that suggests it's really quite a common, these black holes are quite common. So that, does it give you any handle on distribution of black holes around the universe? That's a great question. So that's just what we're beginning to understand. So um, b before, we, before, these before the event was observed in the first place, we didn't know, we had no idea how frequency, frequent that would be, be found. But we found four over the space of a couple of years. Um, so that starts to allow us to do statistics to see how these black holes we distributed. The event that was measured just on Wednesday is particularly interesting because not just two detectors were involved, but there's also a detector uh, in Europe called Virgo, which also detected that uh, event. And the point about having three is that you then start to triangulate where it is in, in, in the um, space. And you get a more precise positioning. So we're going to, in the coming years, understand what the distribution of these black holes are and where they are, and get a much more detailed picture of their distribution. And we'll also get information about how these binary systems will form. So um, if they formed by two supernova, so there's two, a binary system of stars, one goes supernova, turns into a black hole, and then the other one goes supernova, turns into a black hole, then they tend to rotate and their spins are in the same orbit. But if we had a single star, supernova forms a black hole, and then it captured another black hole, in that process, the orbit and the spins can be misaligned. So these details of these gravitational wave detections will start to inform us of those sorts of processes, not just their distribution, but how they were formed in the first place. Right. Okay, please. Can you wait for the microphone? Hello. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned um, particles, uh, quantum particles and antiparticles, and that's vacuum. Uh, can there be a, a perfect vacuum, and would that have energy? So the perfect, so perfect vacuum in quantum theory is not possible. It's necessarily this seething froth of these, these particles and antiparticles coming into being. The slightly deeper explanation is that there are fields which pervade throughout space and time. The Higgs field, for example, is one example of such a field, or the electromagnetic field. And the vacuum is that field in this particular state of bubbling around in the way I was indicating. We can normalize the energy of that system to be zero. There's actually a very interesting point you're raising, though, is that if you do that calculation very carefully, it seems to produce an energy which is at odds with something called the cosmological constant, which is something Einstein came up with in, in formulating his, his general theory of relativity. We know the cosmological constant is extremely small, but thinking about the quantum vacuum predicts naively a very large value for this. So this is actually, it would be another talk, it's actually another of the deep clues to how to unify quantum theory and, and gravity. Over there, please, can you wait for the microphone? If there's anyone in the gallery, please wave wildly because I've got lights. Okay, got us. I'll come to you next. Hello. 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 Um, you talked about the direct and indirect methods of detecting black holes. With Hawking radiation, does that give us a new method of detecting black holes? And is it potentially recordable? And could that give us different information other than just the spin and the mass? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the temperature of the astrophysical black holes, so the ones I was describing in almost all of the talk, are smaller than the temperature of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So if you have a cold object in a hot uh, medium, the black hole will actually absorb that heat. So the astrophysical black holes that I've been talking about, the one at the center of our galaxy, its temperature is so small, we will never 
It's in fact the reverse. It'll absorb heat rather than emit heat. However, there can be very small black holes, and it turns out the smaller the black hole is, the higher the temperature is. So very big black holes are cold, very small black holes are hot. If very small black holes exist, and they could have been formed at the very, big, big, the very early part of the Big Bang, they're called primordial black holes, they will be hot, and we could possibly detect their radiation. So that's one possible astrophysical a signature. And if we did do that, that would be a spectacular discovery. Please. Um, I, w I was wondering that um, since you can create very tiny black holes um, um, under a very... Um, uh, if you had... If you could um, s um, s um, squash something to smaller than its Schwarzschild's radius, but make a very controlled black hole, um, could you observe the process of Hawking radiation um, to give you clues on how string theory and um, quantum mechanics and general relativity would combine? I think that might be a question that, if you're interested, when you grow up, you might be able to pursue. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, at the moment, we don't have any good ideas how you'd form a black hole. You can imagine some extremely powerful lasers or something like that, shining all that energy into a tiny volume and creating them. Um, there was some speculative ideas that at the Large Hadron Collider, that colliding particles could perhaps form black holes and so on. So the short answer is we don't know the answer to that question. And my own feeling is that the story of black holes and quantum theory, we're just at the beginning in this long arc of, of discovery. And there's certainly new possibilities, perhaps along the lines of what you're saying, which could actually happen. I think there was someone in the gallery. Yeah, please. What would happen if um, more than two black holes combined at the same time? So at, in the same split second? So that's, it's actually very hard for that to happen. And remember that the, in the, the figure that I drew, the two black holes are orbiting each other and they coalesce, coalesce in just a tenth of a second. So you could have a system of three black holes. That's not impossible to imagine. And that'll be all orbiting around each other. We don't know if that's, they exist yet, but it's possible. Um, what would probably almost certainly happen is that two would coalesce first. And then you'd have a two, two left. And then later, the third would coalesce. And roughly speaking, each of the two events would be like the gravitational wave signals that would be emitted would be roughly like what I described for just the two. So the third one probably wouldn't make too much of an effect. And there's somebody else in the gallery. In, <clears throat> in 2015, LIGO detected the merger of a, a 36 and 29 uh, solar mass uh, black, black holes with the resultant loss of uh, three of the solar masses to energy. What is the role of gravity in this? Is this actually, actually the conduit, or, 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 or does it contain the energy itself? In which case, what is gravity? Do we really know? So gravity is, is space and time itself, the curvature of space and time itself. So that energy, there is energy in those gravitational waves. So when those bits of those structures in space and time, and all the detail inside, inside the black holes, including the singularity, they're merging together. And when that merger happens, these ripples are formed in space and time, and those ripples have energy. And we know they have energy. For example, they did move our detector. They moved it by a thousandth of the size of the diameter of, of a proton. But that's a, a physical manifestation that it contains energy. Is the, is the gravitational energy spherically distributed around the black hole, or is it a different sort of distribution? It's roughly spherical, so they, they go around, they coalesce, and in all directions, it'll be roughly the same, dissipating as you get further and further away. So one thing is, when, we get, when it gets to Earth, one, after 1.3 billion light years, it's very small. It would still be very small, much closer to the black hole. It'd be a lot bigger, but it'd still be very small. Right, one last question, please. After such uh, an erudite talk, 
I fear this might be rather a, a noddy question. If the uh, electromagnetic radiation cannot escape from a black hole, because uh, the escape velocity is greater, how can gravitational waves escape? They can't surely go faster than electromagnetic waves. So the gravitational waves are caused by the motion of... I mean, it's, it's the waves in space and time itself. So, in fact, gravity waves indirectly were detected by uh, um, a binary system of, neutro of uh, neutron stars. So in that context, there is no event horizon troubling the, um, the system along the lines of what you're describing. But just as they orbit each other, they emit gravitational waves. Just like the Earth, as I said before, or as that orbit orbits the sun, that's emitting gravitational waves. It's just that the black holes, they're emitting a huge amount of gravitational waves because they are encapsulating this very complex and simple structure of space-time. <laughs> And I think that's a good point on thank which you. to thank you. And just many sweet thank Jerome for a super discourse. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>